بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربى The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad I'm going to have to trouble you one more time. One more movement towards the front. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Get as close to the front as you can, my dear brothers. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. The discussion concerning the age of Aisha when the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam married her is one of the most controversial discussions in Islamic thought and a discussion which requires a thorough analysis for it is a discussion which affects the lives of millions of Muslims in the world today. A discussion from which many a lesson may be learnt and many fantastic examples may be derived. And a discussion with a historical basis and a contemporary significance. Contemporary in light of the recent film that was made called The Innocence of Muslims, which sought to attack the character of the Holy Prophet. The attack which was leveled against the Holy Prophet mainly focused on his marriage to Aisha what is seen in Western circles, in certain Western circles as being a marriage of a pedophilic background. Until today, the accusation that the Prophet Muhammad was a man who was like a pedophile is an accusation that rages in a number of circles. Many people since medieval Europe who have sought to attack the character of the Holy Prophet have sought to attack him in terms of his marriages and especially his marriage to Aisha and the idea that many people have come forward and attacked him by saying that how could a man in his early 50s be willing and prepared to marry a girl who is of the age of six because what they normally do is they take the narration from Bukhari and Muslim which states that the Prophet took Aisha and consumed the marriage with Aisha at the age of nine. You therefore find that whenever anyone wants to inquire about the religion of Islam, one of the main questions which they seek to ask is related to the marriage of the Prophet. And the idea that they would always ask that how could a man who is a man of God, a man of morality, a man of principles, be willing to marry someone who is a nine-year-old, and you find that this question is sometimes even posed within our own communities. As in even within our own communities, sometimes a person asks the question that how is it that the Prophet of Islam would marry someone at the age of nine? 
In today's circles, you find that the accusation of pedophilia against him is an accusation because of the fact that if it was to be seen or heard of in today's society, that is what someone would think straight away. And that sometimes is the problem when you are examining a 7th century issue in a 21st century barometer. There are a number of issues in Islamic history you find that when we want to dissect them using 21st century society to look at something that was prevalent in the 7th century is sometimes problematic. And you therefore find that when you ask Muslims how is it that your prophet married someone so young, the reply that normally comes is, well, no, she wasn't a nine-year-old. She was much older. You find very much an apologetic reply on the part of the Muslim. Yet the recent film, The Innocence of Muslims, clearly showed that here was the Prophet Muhammad as acted in that film and portrayed as someone who was with this young child. And this was the same as the Danish cartoons when they drew the Prophet Muhammad with a young child. And this has been the same in every attack on the Prophet Muhammad. And therefore there is a need for us to be able to reply to such attacks. Firstly, because there's a duty for us to honor the life of this man. As Muslims, it's our role that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have to constantly honor his sunnah. He is an example for us. Anyone who attacks him is attacking you at the same time. On the second level, it's vital that we clear such misconceptions about his life. Because there are many people who may not be Muslim, but innocently are seeking to understand his life are seeking to understand why is it that a billion people honor this man. If we don't clear these misconceptions, then there is a need for us at least to try and assess this issue in order that we are able to give the context to how this particular issue developed. Therefore, tonight I'd like to dissect in depth the issue of the marriage of the Prophet to the young Aisha by asking the following questions. Number one, is Islam a religion that allows the freedom of opinion? Or is it a religion that does not allow anyone to inquire about prophethood and the prophets of God? Number two, what is the case put forward by those who say that Aisha was older than 14 when the prophet married her? Number three, how is it that we are able to reply to these arguments? Number four, do we need to be apologetic about the age when the Prophet married Aisha? Or is it that we need to put the marriage into a social context? Number five, how important is the marriage of Ali and Fatima when looking at the age of the wife in Arabian society? And number six, how important is it for us to understand the role of the wives of the soldiers on the 10th of Muharram? Let's dissect this and seek to dissect the topic in complete depth. When this film was made, a number of people came forward with an important question. Does Islam as a religion allow the freedom for a person to ask questions or no? Or is it a religion purely of blind imitation and faith? Because as soon as this film was made, there was uproar and outrage in the Muslim world. And at the end, it resulted in the killing of an ambassador of a country. Of course, as Muslims, we do not condone the killing of a human being. Nor do we condone this person who is an ambassador being killed because of a film that was made in that country. Two wrongs do not make a right. And certainly that killing is not something which is acceptable. However, there is a question that requires an answer. Us as Muslims, do we allow a non-Muslim to question the prophethood of our prophet or no? Because we can't always claim that our prophet is the seal of the prophets, he is the great prophet of God, yet as soon as someone puts a question mark on him, we get angry. As in surely if we're a religion which is confident about its beliefs, we will allow freedom of speech and freedom to question. A religion which doesn't allow questioning is a religion which isn't confident about its structure. As in if today there is a religion which says to you, you can't question it, that religion is therefore uncertain about its theological structure. Therefore, is the religion of Islam a religion which is uncertain about its teachings? 
Because if a religion doesn't allow you to question its prophet, that shows that the people of the religion are people who are uncertain. You find that our reply is that no, on the contrary, the ethos of the religion of Islam is an ethos which encourages you to question. It encourages you to even be skeptical in order that maybe through questioning and skepticism you are able to find the answers to your questions as in how am I meant to find the answer to my question in this religion unless I am allowed to pose it if you look at the very origin of the ethos of this religion you'll find the origin of the ethos of this religion is that it's an ethos where you are allowed to even question your Lord's decisions someone says what do you mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first created Adam and said to the angels, I'm sending him down as my caliph on the earth. Did the angels reply by saying, yes, our Lord Almighty, we thank you very much for this decision. Or did the angels have the audacity to even question their Lord? You find the angels had the audacity to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are you going to send down someone who causes mischief and bloodshed while we worship you and sing your blessings? I ask you, when an angel questions Allah's decision, does Allah reply by punishing the angel or does Allah simply reply by saying, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know that which you do not know. If the Lord of the heavens is willing to be tolerant of the opinion of his angels, then how can I as a Muslim not be tolerant of the opinion of my fellow human beings? At the end of the day, the Lord of the heavens showed us, I am Allah, the Almighty. Yet when I announced that Adam would be my caliph, I allowed the angels to question me. Therefore, the ethos of this religion from the outset was what? There is no harm whatsoever if a person questions even the Lord. And that's why even our Holy Prophet, those who say that you can't question anything in this religion, our Holy Prophet had companions who surrounded him, who in some cases not just questioned him, questioned his whole prophethood. Did he push them away or did he allow them to remain in his company? As in there's one companion who's willing to call him delirious. There's another companion who on the day of Hudaybiyah questions his prophethood. Do you find Rasulullah turning around and saying, I'm sorry, you can't call me delirious or you can't question me? On the contrary, the Quran is full of verses which begin, Yes, alunaka. They question you concerning. They question you concerning. If the Quran begins its verses with yes alunaka, it indicates that the Prophet of God is saying very clearly that this is a religion where questions are part and parcel of the teachings of the whole makeup of this religion. Therefore, if Islam promotes questioning, why is it that we have a problem with this film Innocence of Muslims? Because we say there's a difference between the freedom of speech and the freedom to insult. You're allowed to have freedom of speech. You're allowed to question, you're allowed to inquire, but have a certain etiquette when you question a man revered by a billion people in the world today. I don't mind today if a Christian friend of mine says to me, Sayyid Ammar, to tell you the truth, your Prophet Muhammad, there are certain areas of his life I don't really agree with. And the reason I don't agree with them is X, Y, and Z, from book X, from page Y. I'll turn around to him very clearly and I'll say, well, let me discuss each of these references with you. However, when someone shows a film, which is a budget film, where it's a complete insult on a man who is revered not just by Muslims, by, but by many non-Muslims, then Islam says we don't mind freedom of speech, but we'll never allow the freedom to insult. Likewise, if I find a Muslim insulting a Christian leader or a Jewish leader with something which is as audacious and low as making such a film, then I'd be angry with a Muslim leader if he did that as well. As in even in our own Muslim communities, if someone is insulting towards another school in Islam, do we accept such behavior or do we reprimand it? He may be a Muslim, he believes in the Prophet and his message. But at the end of the day, if he does something which is insulting, we do not allow it. That's why when he made this film, had he made a film and said that the Prophet Muhammad married Aisha at the age of nine, and I can't see the wisdom behind this, then we'd explain to him what is the wisdom. However, the film tried to show that this man's a pedophile. This man, all he lusted after was these young girls in Arabia. 
How do we reply to this? One school came back with a reply by saying, if you study Islamic literature, like the books of history and the books of hadith, you'll find that Aisha was no way nine years of age. You'll find that Aisha was a minimum of 14 and a maximum of 20. This particular group come forward and say that when you accuse the Prophet Muhammad of marrying a nine-year-old, this is not true because when you have a careful discussion of the sources which discuss Aisha and discuss his marriage, clearly Aisha was much older than nine. I want your maths and your history to work with me now. Mathematics and history. How? They say, when did Rasulullah marry Aisha? He married her in the second year after his migration. The Holy Prophet was in Mecca for how many years when he announced his prophethood? 13. And in Medina for how many years? 10. Do we agree? So in Mecca, he was there for 13 years after announcement. And then in Medina for 10. When he was in Medina, he was 53 years of age when he arrived to Medina. So he marries Aisha in the second year after Hijra. Do we agree? They put forward their arguments by saying, Aisha is no way a nine-year-old. You say to them why, they give you their proofs. They say the first proof why Aisha is no way a nine-year-old when she marries the Prophet is because Aisha herself states that I was a young girl when Surah Al-Qamar was revealed. I was a young girl when Surah Al-Qamar was revealed. Now, Surah Al-Qamar was revealed, according to many sources, nine years before the Hijrah. If Aisha was a young girl, say four or five years of age in that terminology in the Arabic language, when Surah Al-Qamar was revealed, if she's four or five, and Surah Al-Qamar was revealed nine years before Hijrah, how old would Aisha be when she marries the Holy Prophet? 15. Why? Because if she is, say, for example, four years of age, when Surah Al-Qamar is revealed, nine years before Hijrah, so on the day of Hijrah, how old is she? 13. Add two years in terms of the marriage after, how old would she be? 15. So the first argument that they pose is what? They say that here it's a clear proof that Aisha was 15 when the Prophet married her. Their second argument is Aisha accompanied the Holy Prophet in the battle of Uhud. The Holy Prophet wouldn't take people who were under 15 to battles. He would first say, have you reached adolescence, O soldier? If the soldier says, I've reached adolescence, then the Prophet would take him to the battle. But Aisha came with the Prophet to the battle of Uhud. They say this clearly shows that Aisha was 15 years of age because Rasulullah would not take anyone under 15. And Aisha was definitely above 15 according to them because the Prophet took her with him to the battle of Uhud. That's their second proof. The third proof which they give that Aisha was not nine years of age, they say that Abu Bakr, his four children, were all born in the days of Jahiliyyah. The days of Jahiliyyah, when are they? They are before the Prophet announces his prophethood, isn't it? So before the Prophet says, I'm a prophet of God, that is classified as the days of Jahiliyyah. Abu Bakr has four children. If they are all born in the days of Jahiliyyah and Aisha is the youngest of them. If we were to say that Aisha was born a year before the Prophet announces his prophethood, then how old would Aisha be at the time when she marries Rasulullah? 15, for example, again. Because if Aisha is one year of age before Rasulullah announces his prophethood, Rasulullah, how many years was he in Mecca? 13. 1 plus 13 is how much? 14. If she is married to him in the second year after Hijrah, plus 2, what is that? 15 or 16. <clears throat> so that's their next argument. Then their next argument after that, which is quite a strong argument, and that is that Asma bint Abu Bakr, 
the eldest daughter of Abu Bakr, died at the age of 100 in the 73rd year after Hijrah. Asma was known to be 10 years older than Aisha. If Asma died at the age of 100 in the 73rd year after Hijrah, how old would Asma be in the first year after Hijrah? 100 minus 73 is what? 27. Asma is 10 years older than Aisha, so how old would Aisha be? 17. Add another year, how old would Aisha be when she marries the Prophet? 18. You find that these are all seen as being the proofs unanimously that Aisha was definitely not nine years of age. As you said, Surah Al-Qamar is the first proof you find. Then of the other proofs is taking someone to the battle of Uhud. They have to be above 15. Then the next proof, Abu Bakr's children. Then the next proof that Asma was 10 years above all of them. In terms of all of these arguments, I find that only one of them is strong. Whereas the other three can all be answered. What do we mean when we say that only one of them is strong? Aisha says that I was a young girl when Surah Al-Qamar was revealed. So someone said that if she's a young girl, she would be four or five, add nine years, add a couple of years, she would be 15. The actual hadith says, Aisha was a young girl when verse 46 of Surah Al-Qamar was revealed. Not the whole of Surah Al-Qamar. And we know verses of the Quran, some parts can be Meccan, some can be Medinian. So Aisha could have easily been a young girl when this verse was revealed as part of Surah Al-Qamar in Medina. It doesn't mean she has to be a young girl in Mecca when this verse was revealed. That's number one. Number two, that person who says that because Rasulullah took Aisha to the battlefield, it shows that Aisha was above 15. 15 is seen as the age for adolescence for the male, not the female. When you take the male to the battlefield, he has to be 15. But why are you putting that attribution on the female? Why can Aisha not have been at an age of adolescence that Rasulullah took her with him to the battle of Uhud and she may have only been 9 or 10 years of age when she's gone towards the battle of Uhud? And even this argument that Rasulullah did not take anyone who was under adolescence, Haritha went with Rasulullah to the battle of Badr, he was 14 years of age. And he fought with Rasulullah. And his mother said to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, is my son Haritha amongst the people of Jannah? He said, not just any Jannah, he's in the highest Jannah, Jannah al Firdos. Therefore, that's number two. Number three, those who say Abu Bakr, all his children were born in the days of Jahiliyyah. That's not the actual hadith. The actual hadith is Abu Bakr got married in the days of Jahiliyyah to two wives. It doesn't mean all of his children were born in the days of Jahiliyyah. I can marry my wife in the days of Jahiliyyah, but then later on my wife gives birth after the days of Jahiliyyah. The only argument which I find plausible out of these arguments that Aisha could have been married to Rasulullah at a later age is the Asma bint Abu Bakr argument. That yes, Asma bint Abu Bakr, even Nawawi in his Tahdeeb, Nawawi mentions that Asma bint Abu Bakr was 100 years of age in the 73rd year after Hijrah. Now some have put forward an argument that Asma bint Abu Bakr may have been 91 when she died. Whereas in many narrations, Asma is narrated to have died at the age of 100, which means if she was 10 years older than Aisha, at the time Aisha got married to Rasulullah, then Aisha would have been 18 years of age. That's the only one of the apologetic arguments what could say is what could be put forward, that Aisha was older than nine. However, the question arises, do we need to be apologetic about Aisha's marriage to the Prophet? As in, do I really need to beg a non-Muslim to believe me that Rasulullah, that Rasulullah did not marry a nine-year-old? Because some people have come forward and said what? They said, we have to find ways of showing that Rasulullah no way married a nine-year-old. We have to find ways. We reply by saying, why do I have to be apologetic? Why? 
Rather, I can explain the context of this marriage. Firstly, in the school of Ahl al-Bayt, we need to ask a question. Do we believe Bukhari's hadith that Rasulullah was accepted to marry Aisha when she was six? And then he consummated the marriage at the age of nine? No, we don't take this hadith in the school of Ahl al-Bayt. You know what the problem is? The problem with this hadith is what? The hadith in Muslim, the way it describes the marriage is something we don't take in the school of Ahl al-Bayt. The description is what has caused us much trouble in the school of Ahl al-Bayt. You know what the description is? You know who narrates she being married to the Prophet at the age of nine, but the acceptance of her, his proposal at six? She narrates it about herself. You know what she says? Unbelievable. She narrates that I was playing on the swings. I was playing on the swings, and the swings were connected to two trees. While I was playing on the swings, my hair used to reach my ears at that time to indicate how young she is. Then all of a sudden, my mother came and took me. She fixed me up. I was playing with my dolls. My mother took me. She fixed me up, and she said, Hey, now I'm going to give you to Muhammad. We in the school of Ahl al don't take this narration. I don't care that other schools may take it. That's their books. I respect their literature, but we don't take this narration. But it's the narration that causes us trouble. Why? If I, as a Muslim, read this narration, I'll be thinking, what's happening here? There's a six-year-old playing on the swings. Now she's age nine. She's playing on the swings and her dolls. She says her hair's up till here. Then all of a sudden, my mother fixed me up. I didn't know what was happening to me. I was taken to Muhammad's house. That's not what we take in the school of Ahl al-Bayt. From the first level, we need to understand that that hadith about a six-year-old then getting married as a nine-year-old while she's playing on swings with dolls is not part of the traditions of the school of Ahl al-Bayt. If it's not part of the traditions, then is there a possibility in the school of Ahl al-Bayt that we believe Rasulullah married Aisha when Aisha was nine or ten years of age? Yes, there is. Even in Al-Kafi, there is a narration which clearly states from Ismail, the son of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ismail, the son of Imam al-Sadiq, states that Rasulullah consummated his marriage with Aisha when Aisha was 10 years of age. Some have raised the question that Ismail ibn Ja'far is not ma'soom, therefore we can't take the reliability. He's the son of a ma'soom, but it doesn't mean we take him as reliable. Even though this hadith is there within Al-Kafi, yet what is the problem with us accepting that our Prophet married someone who was 10 years of age? Is there a problem? Do we need to be apologetic? On the first level, we don't take the hadith about the dolls and the swings. But is there a problem? No, all of this can be explained. How can we explain it? Please understand the explanation. Firstly, we recognize, be you a sociologist or an anthropologist, or someone in the world of biology, that the age for marriage differs from one country to another, from one state to another, because of the recognition that the age for adolescence differs from one part of the world to the other. In Indonesia, the consent for getting married is 19. In America, the consent for getting married is 16. There are parts of Texas where a man may marry someone normally, according to Texan law, may marry them at the age of 14. The recognition there, number one, is that socially, one state differs from the other. Secondly, the recognition there is that in adolescence, you may find that the age for adolescence differs from one part of the world to the other. You may go to a certain part of India, adolescence may be seen at the age of 10. Another part of the world, adolescence may be seen at 12. Another part of the world, adolescence may be at 13. You therefore find, if you were to study human history, it is not unusual when we say the Prophet Muhammad married someone at this age. For goodness sake, if the Christian evangelical wants to attack the Prophet Muhammad for his marriage to someone at this age, I ask the Christian one fundamental question. In Jewish society, when Mary was present, what was the average age of the daughters who were getting married in Jewish society at the time? They'll reply to you by saying 10, 11, 
12, maximum 15. Were they marrying men who were all 20 or 18 or 16? No, they were marrying people in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s. Building on this, I asked the question that when you're telling me they're marrying people of this age, I want to ask a fundamental question about a lady who a Christian reveres. Mary, mother of Jesus, when did the Lord decide to breathe his spirit into her? Because if you're not going to say that Joseph is a pedophile, because you're going to attack the Prophet Muhammad, you're saying the Prophet Muhammad is a pedophile. Well, if I ask you about Joseph, you say to me, well, Joseph entered upon Mary, maybe he was in his 50s or 60s. I said, no problem. D say it's not Joseph. When did the Lord decide to breathe his spirit into Mary? When she was 12? The Lord didn't think that there's a possibility that this 12-year-old can't handle the most important figure in mankind's history? How old was Mary? 12, according to Catholicism? 12 years old. Did you once find an accusation that Joseph is a pedophile because he was way older than her? Or did you ever find anyone questioning the Lord for breathing his spirit into a 12-year-old? Why didn't you find the questioning? Because it was normal in that society that when someone reaches adolescence, the option is there to marry them. Some families know their daughters may be ready. Other families say, no way, our daughters are ready. Impossible. They're not mature enough. There is no way. You weren't obligatorily forced to marry. But you find that there were cultures where it was the norm. When a Christian, number one, comes and attacks the Holy Prophet, the first reply is what? Is that when Mary took in the Holy Spirit, Mary was 12. The Lord didn't find a problem with a 12-year-old carrying the most important child in human history. Number one. Number two. Those people who come and accuse the Holy Prophet of being a pedophile, I can name you a number of kings in history who consummated a marriage when their wife was extremely young. Go and study Richard II, Edward I, Edward II, the Henrys who ruled this country. Never once do you find them being accused of being a pedophile. Go and study their wives. Read about Isabella, read about Eleanor, read about the other Isabella of Angoulême. How old were they? 10, 11, 10, 11. Did anyone come and say this person's a pedophile for what he's done? No. These were princesses who were ready to be courted. And therefore, because they were princesses who were ready to be courted, they were to be what? They were to be honored in their societies, that they married the king of their time. You ask, how old was the king? Say, so some cases 35, some cases 45. But these daughters were different from any other daughters. Isabella, Eleanor, they were courted in the best of families, and therefore they were able to get married. That's number two. Number three, and something of the utmost importance in this area, which needs to be examined properly, what is it? Is that the Holy Prophet, very clearly, when a person comes and says that the Holy Prophet is a man who is a pedophile, did the Holy Prophet come to bring misery for young Muslim woman or Arabian woman, or did he come to reform the rights of young Arabian woman? When the Holy Prophet came to Arabian society, was he a man who came and said that, you know, these girls who are being buried alive, keep burying them alive? Or was he a man who said that this girl who's being buried alive, on the day of judgment, she will ask, why am I being buried alive? This was a man who came to reform the rights of the woman from being buried alive. The Arabs used to say, this woman is of no use to us. This was a man who allowed a woman to inherit, not be inherited. This was a man who gave rights to the wife in a marriage. And what better way to show the rights of a wife in a marriage than by you acting it in your own marriages, isn't it? Then number four, was it something frowned upon in Arabian society? As in Arabian society at the time, did you have people saying, oh my God, I can't believe it. Muhammad's married someone who's 10 years of age. Imam al-Shafi'i narrates, when I went to Yemen, and Imam al-Shafi'i is how many years after Rasulullah? Imam al-Shafi'i is, let's say, 150 years after the Prophet. Imam al-Shafi'i says, I went to Yemen, I saw a lady who was a grandmother at the age of 21. How old? at the age of 21 in Yemeni society. There was a lady who was a grandmother. This lady who was a grandmother had got married at the age of 10, had had her child, her child got married and had another child. 
you find that it was not something unusual. In Yemen, you didn't have anyone going around saying, oh my God, this is so unusual. The person who must have done it is a pedophile. No, it was normal in that Yemeni society, in that culture, there was no one who was frowning upon such a marriage at all. In that culture, it was seen as something completely normal. Take it a step further. Did Aisha ever once turn around and complain that that man has treated me abysmally in life? That man has ruined my life. That man is the worst of men who gives me no rights whatsoever. Because you'd expect if a man has got this ferocious attitude of pedophilia. What is pedophilia? Pedophilia is you don't just lust on one girl. You lust on many young girls. You want to kill and destroy the lives of these young girls. You yourself are ill. You yourself are sick. Did Aisha ever turn around and say this man treated me abysmally? This man doesn't give me any rights. On the contrary, every word of her is a praise of the Holy Prophet. She herself, every word of her, she praises his patience with her. She praises his humility with her. Never once do you find Aisha turning around and saying, you know that man who married me, he ruined my life. She said, on the contrary, that man who married me is the greatest man to have ever lived on this earth. You would think someone who's been obstructed in their life would never want to see the face of such a man again. Someone would want to turn around and say, this is the man who caused me dishonor. And my father, Abu Bakr, has ruined my life for allowing me to marry. No, on the contrary. Abu Bakr, the father, gave consent. In pedophilia, you don't get such thing where a father gives consent. In pedophilia, a father's life is ruined when this psychopath comes and destroys his child's life. Whereas Abu Bakr, if he ever heard that Aisha was attacking Rasulullah, he would be angered. Take this a step further. You think Aisha is like any normal young girl? You think Aisha is a normal young girl, 10 years old? No one had as much opinion, no one was as opinionated or as abrupt with their opinions in the history of Islam as Aisha, the wife of Rasulullah. <laughs> Aisha can take you to the river and bring you back thirsty if she wants. You think you're talking to any 10-year-old? You're talking to a lady who in her nine years with Rasulullah virtually put Islam around her finger. You think you're talking to someone young? Go and dissect Aisha, daughter of Abu Bakr. Dissect her nine years with Rasulullah. That's young? There are certain 10-year-olds who you could tell timid, immature. There are some, in one sentence, you could be 40 years older than them, she'll put you down like this. They vary in terms of their house, in terms of their upbringing, in terms of their culture that surrounds them. This was the Aisha who told Hafsa, tell me, what's the secret? What's he told you? When the Quran said, one wife tells the other a secret, Surah 66 verse 3. This was the Aisha who told Hafsa, you know what, when the man goes to visit Zainab again, let's tell him that his breath doesn't smell nice, so he doesn't visit her house and drink that drink again. This was the Aisha who told the Prophet, why do you spend so much time with Ali ibn Abi Talib? Why don't you spend that time with me? This was the Aisha who told the Prophet, why do you always remember Khadija? Why don't you remember me? Aren't I your most beloved wife? You think you're talking to any 10-year-old? You're talking to a 10-year-old, if she wants to, she can control every house in the religion of Islam in Medina at that time. When we talk of Rasulullah marrying a 10-year-old, you'd think that this is a timid 10-year-old who has no say at all in her life. This was someone who without a doubt had the ability to run a whole house by herself. To the extent she'd tell the Prophet, why do you visit all those wives? Why don't you just come to my house? I'll run the house for you. You find therefore when you take each of these reasons on board, you realize there is no need for a person to have to be apologetic about Rasulullah marrying someone who's 10 years of age. Yes, there's a possibility that Rasulullah, the acceptance for marriage was at the age of 10 for Aisha. But the actual consummation when they came together may have been later. That there's a possibility. But there is still no need for a person to have to beg, friend, and defend everyone by saying that, no, my prophet is not that type. On the contrary, Rasulullah, you find those who praise Rasulullah, if you read the works of people like Gandhi, if you read Guru Nanak, if you read the Seventh-day Adventist Christians who are alive until today, they could have, many of them could have easily pointed and said, Muhammad, the nine, how could he be with a nine-year-old? Many of them said, a man with the morals of Muhammad, how can you question anything he does? You find that Rasulullah, 
Was he looking for a lustful intention behind this marriage with Aisha? No. Rasulullah's most beloved wife all his life was Khadija. By his nature, he was monogamous. 25 years of age, he married Khadija. He remained with her for 26 years. A man of lust or desire should get married in his prime to many women. From the age of 25 until the age of 51, Khadija was everything for him in life. After Khadija died, then he went on to marry the other wives. Therefore, you find on the next step on this issue, those who come and say, no way, my prophet would never marry someone so young. I tell them, well, then how are you meant to exp uh, explain Ali ibn Abi Talib's marriage to Fatima al-Zahra? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. How old was Imam Ali when he married Fatima al-Zahra? 25, let's say. And how old was Fatima al-Zahra? 10. 10. You find anyone in the school of Ahlul Bayt having to defend Ali ibn Abi Talib? No. We are proud that we know how the lady of light is because she's been brought up in a household of honor and dignity. And we know Amir al Mu'mineen has been brought up in a household of honor and dignity. I could easily turn around and say, no, 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 make Fatima's age older. I beg you. I don't want Imam Ali to be seen that he's. There are certain social conditions which differ from society to society. There are social norms which differ from society to society. Fatima to Zahra may get married at 10. Even go a step further. Sayyida Zainab when she got married. Sayyida Zainab was a couple of years older than her mother when she got married. Not more. So I have to now defend Sayyida Zainab. The point is there's no need to be apologetic. What there is is first an understanding of the conditions in Arabia. Secondly, not only in Arabia, go and study Jewish society, Christian society, it was a norm. There was nothing which was found upon. Now someone asked the question that today in our society, because there was a story of a man in Somalia, he was 112 years old, he married a 13 year old. MashaAllah. 112 marries a 13 year old. They asked him why. He said, Rasulullah married Aisha. What do you mean Rasulullah married Aisha? You're 112, you're marrying a 13 year old? As an honestly, you look at this situation, can I take this example in my life and say, well, because Rasulullah was 54 and Aisha was 10, I'm gonna do the same. No, on the contrary. Rasulullah says that you two have to be compatible with each other, you can get married. If there are manners, you can get married. Also reflect on the society within which you're living and respect the laws of your land. Respect the laws of your land. All our scholars say, if the laws of this land say that you cannot marry someone at that age, then you can't turn around and say, well, you know what, I'll do it in secret, but no one will know. I have to respect the laws of the land. Like those Muslims in Yemen and in Medina and in Mecca respected the laws of their land. There was no one saying there's a problem with marrying a 10 year old. Today in the UK, if the age of consent, let's say is 18 or 21, I have to respect the laws of the land. And if the age of consent is 16 in America, I have to respect. I can't just say, oh, because my prophet married someone else, I'm going to, no. You have to honor the laws of your land. You want to live by those laws? There are countries you can go and stay in. There are countries which may accept this. But when you are in a country like this, you can't abuse an example just for your own liking. Therefore, what do you find? You found that likewise Imam al-Jawad, when Imam al-Jawad had to marry the daughter of Ma'moon, the agreement for the marriage, Imam al-Jawad was how old when Ma'moon forced him to agree to marry his uh, daughter? How old was Imam al-Jawad? Nine. And then Ma'moon's daughter was how old? Nine. But the consummation of the marriage was later. Likewise, there is no harm in saying that Rasulullah may have been accepted for the marriage of Aisha 10, but the consummation of the marriage may have been later. But truly, without a doubt, Rasulullah with Khadija, Imam Amir al muminin with Fatima, these were without a doubt the two greatest marriages in the history of this religion. As in these were marriages which taught us the principles of how to live together, of how to honor each other, of how to bring each other towards the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How a husband has to be clothing for his wife and the wife has to be clothing for the husband. A husband has to protect his wife and the wife has to protect her husband. 
and you did not see this more clearly than the wives of the companions of Imam al Hussein on the 10th of Muharram. Sometimes people ask the question, why did these wives come on the 10th of Muharram? Why did Imam al Hussein bring his wives? Why did Imam bring his daughters? It's because Imam al Hussein knew this religion would remain alive through the woman of the religion. It's these ladies who will protect my message. It's these ladies who will honor this message. The number of wives that were at Karbala was phenomenal. You had Zainab, wife of Abdullah ibn Ja'far. You had, for example, Daylam, the wife of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. You had, for example, the wife of Wahab al-Kalbi. You had Rabab, the wife of Imam al Hussein. Many wives were present at Karbala. Each one of them had a different role. But two wives in particular, their stories are different, but their intentions were the same by the end of the 10th of Muharram. The first of them was Daylam, the wife of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. Zuhair ibn al-Qayn originally was on the side of Uthman, not Imam Ali. Zuhair ibn al-Qayn was an Uthmani. He wasn't an Alawi. He used to support Uthman ahead of Imam Ali. Zuhair was returning from Hajj. While he was returning, Imam al Hussein was returning from Hajj or going towards Kufa. Their tents were at the same place. Zuhair was in his tent. Imam al Hussein was in his tent. Zuhair was sitting in his tent. The narration mentions his wife looked at him. She said to him, Zuhair, you look nervous. What's wrong? He said to her, no, no, there is nothing. It's just that, uh, you know, there's a problem, but I'm thinking about it now. Imam al-Hussein wanted Zuhair on his side because he knew Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, politically, the facts had not come to him. Imam al Hussein knew at the same time Zuhair ibn al-Qayn was a man of honor and a man of dignity. So Imam al Hussein, what did he do? He wanted to send a messenger to Zuhair ibn al Qayn. So he sent a messenger to Zuhair ibn al Qayn. The messenger came and said to Zuhair, Zuhair, Imam al Hussein wants to see you. Zuhair came back into the tent. When he came back into the tent, he was wandering around the tent. His wife looked at him. She said to him, Zuhair, what's wrong? Please tell me. He said to her, it's nothing. She said to him, no, no, tell me what's wrong. He said to her, Hussein, son of Ali, has asked to see me, and I'm not sure about what to do. The answer she gives is an answer that sends shivers down the spine of the lover of Fatima al-Zahra. She looks at him in his eyes and she says, the son of Fatima al-Zahra calls you and you are here next to me. The son of Rasul Allah calls you and you remain here next to me. He turned around to her. He was about to leave. He said to her, I know he wants me to join him at Karbala. She said to him, and you doubt whether it's right to join him. Isn't this man the grandson of the man who bought the religion? But she said a line to him just before he left the tent. She said to him, oh Zuhair, if you're going to go with Abba Abdullah, go. But can I request something from you? He said to her, go ahead, what's the request? She said to him, tell Zainab, if they are caught as prisoners at Karbala, can I join them as one of the prisoners? As in, I don't want to be left alone. I know that you may end up being killed. But do you mind that I am also amongst the prisoners? Tell Zainab. Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, my dear brothers and sisters, when he joined Imam al Hussein, he began to cry by Abba Abdullah. Then on the 10th of Muharram, when he went out to fight, you know, on the night of the 10th of Muharram, Sayyidah Zainab was looking at Imam al Hussein. She said, are you sure these companions are ready to fight alongside you? Zuhair heard this, he began to cry. He then came to Imam al-Hussein later. He said to Abba Abdullah, Ya Abba Abdullah, if they cut my body into a thousand pieces and I was resurrected a thousand times, I would be honored to die a thousand times for you and for your grandfather. Abba Abdullah hugged Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. And that's why the narrations mention that he fought one of the most valiant fights at Karbala. He killed 120 from the opposition until at the end they surrounded him and they absolutely massacred his body. And on the 10th of Muharram, he's the only man who when he died, Abba Abdullah raised his hands and said, Ya Allah, raise his killers as pigs on the day of judgment. I love Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. I cannot bear to see the way that they've just massacred him there on the plains of Karbala. That was Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. Then there was another wife, but her story is different. The wife of Wahab al-Kalbi. Wahab, his wife, they had just got married and they were both Christian. They were both Christian 
and they had got married. When Imam al Hussein was passing Wahab's mother's house, Wahab was standing outside. He saw Imam al Hussein. He said, Who are you? He said, I am Hussein. He said, Hussein, son of who? He said, Hussein, son of Ali, son of Abu Talib. He said to him, where are you heading? He said, I'm heading towards a battlefield. I have to fight against the injustice of our time. There's an oppressive ruler and he's not giving rights to anyone. Wahab looked at him and he said to him, may God help you in your task. <laughs> Wallah, when he returned home, as soon as he entered the house, his mother looked at him. She said to him, who were you speaking to? He said to her, I was speaking to Hussein. He said, which Hussein? She said, he said, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She said, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib? He said to her, yes. She began to cry. He said to her, mom, why are you crying? She said, if it wasn't for the prayers of his father, you wouldn't be born. He began to cry. He said to her, mom, what do you mean? She said, Wahab. When I was pregnant, I faced a difficulty in my pregnancy. And your father was scared that if I gave birth to you, that either you were going to die or I was going to die. But as a Christian, he didn't know who to ask at the time. But he used to respect Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he went to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he said to him, Oh Ali, <laughs> I'm a Christian and you are a Muslim, but I believe you are a man of God. So do you mind praying for my, for my wife? Imam Amir al muminin you know his heart is the greatest heart. <laughs> ya Allah, allow us to be in Najaf suit. <laughs> Next to the grave of Amir al <laughs> For those of you who haven't been to Najaf, I pray that all of you visit that holy grave. She said, said Imam Amir al muminin at that moment, she narrates that he said to your father, he said, do not worry. You may be a Christian, but if you love God, we love God. I will I pray will for, your for your wife, wife that, she that she has, has a, child, a child and that and your, that child, your child, child as well. well, well. She said, she said well, well, go and go help, and the, help son the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She said, she said well, I will I not will be, be proud of you unless, unless you lose, you lose your, your life. life. Next to him. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, Wahab, Wahab had just had got married. His wife, His wife said, said to him, to my, husband, my husband, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, he said, I'm going to join the religion of Islam. And I, and I want, want to join, to join Ali's, Ali's son. son. She, said, she said, to said to him, she said to him, but we've just got married. Are you going to leave me? He said to her, come with me. She said, I don't want you to die. He said, he said to her, do not, not worry. worry. Heaven, Heaven awaits, awaits us. She said, she said I, don't I don't want, want you, to, you die. to die. You know, it's her right. right. This is her, her husband. husband. 17, 17 days, days they've, they've been, married. been married. She said, she to, said to him, I don't, I don't want, want you to, you to die. die. When they when reached, they reached the, the tenth of Muharram, she was with him. The companions, the companions came, came out, out one by one. Habib, Habib Muslim, Muslim. Zuhair. Zuhair. They, they came, came out, out one by one. 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 Then Wahab, Wahab came out. He said, Aba Abdullah, it's my turn. <laughs> Imam al Hussein said to him, Wahab, you don't have to. Your wife? Your wife? He said, Aba Abdullah, may my mother be sacrificed for you. Just picture Just that tariq in Karbala. Karbala. Those, of, Those you of you who haven't, who haven't been, been, may Allah, may Allah let, you, let go. you go. He came he to came bid to farewell to his mom. His mom, mom. His mom said, I'm smiling, I'm smiling today. today. My, My son, son joins the son of Fatima but is Zahra. 
He is about to leave for the battlefield. As he is about to leave, his wife says, don't go. And he turns around to her and he says to her, I must go. She again calls back to him, Wahab, Wahab, don't go. He again replies back to her by saying to her, I must go. As he is walking towards the battlefield, his head is bowed towards the ground. She says to him again, I beg you, don't go. He replies to her, I must go towards the battlefield. At that moment from the side of the camp of Imam al Hussein, he hears a cry saying, Wahab, fight amongst the pure ones of Al Muhammad. He's surprised. Why? He turns around. He turns around to her and he says to her, You said to me not to go, not to go, not to go. Why have you changed your mind? This reply is one of the saddest replies. She says to him, Wahab, don't blame me. The tears of the children of Abba Abdullah are killing me. I see Ruqayya on one side. I see Sukain on the other. But I see a six-month-old baby whose lips are dry without any water. He fights valiantly amongst the soldiers until they finally kill him. His wife doesn't want to leave him. She runs by his body. She cries by his body. Shimon bin al Joshan orders his slave to go and behead his wife. His wife and him are now lying next to each other. Shimmer the Mal'oon, Umar bin Sa'ad, pick up the head of Wahab. They throw his head to his mother. You know what his mother does? She throws the head back to them. She says to them, I wish I had more sons to give towards the son of Fatima al-Zahra. MashaAllah, may Allah bless these tears. But let's not forget Zuhair ibn al -Qain. You know, on the night of the 11th of Muharram, you know, this narration, one of the scholars would narrate it, one of the maraji'ah. On the night of the 11th of Muharram, all the bodies lay on the ground in Karbala. All of these bodies lay with no protection. Then at that moment, Zuhair's wife, Daylam, she had a servant with her. Daylam called her servant. She said, to the servant, oh servant, come here next to me. The servant came next to her. She said to her, take this cloth, go out and look for Zuhair. I want you to go and cover my husband's body. The servant went out towards the battlefield. The servant began to look around. Then the servant returned back to Dalem. Dalem looked at the servant. Dalem said, did you cover my husband's body? The servant said, no. Dalem said, why? She said, as I was about to cover the body of Zuhair, I saw the holy body of Abba Abdullah lying without any cover. <laughs> so I walked towards the body of Abba Abdullah to cover his body with the cloth. <laughs> Brothers, brothers and sisters, listen to the reply of Daylam. The poets give you the reply. Daylam says, Jazakallah, khair al Then the poets say, she says, How dare I ask for my husband's body to be covered when the body of the son of Fatima is Zahra lies alone? <laughs> May Allah bless these tears. May Allah bless you. Raise your hands, my dear brothers and sisters. Raise your hands. Ya Allah, raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Allow us to be amongst the companions of Imam Sahib al Zaman. Ya Allah, raise us with the Imam of our time. Ya Allah, give patience to the Imam of our time on a night like this when he remembers his grandfather, Imam al Hussein. 
We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Allahumma salam.